All right. Well, I heard I missed two good times of worship with you guys for the Christmas Eve service and then last Sunday. Um, we were traveling to Mississippi and back. Glad to go there and see Amy's family, and glad, but glad to be back. So Happy New Year. We made it. You know, I've heard a lot of people say, you know, good riddance to 2020. We were watching the, the ball drop um, New Year's Eve, and one of the titles of, of one of the shows we're watching said, es <laughs> Escape from 2020. But, you know, God is good all the time. Amen? Amen. And I have tremendous stories of God's glory in the Wells family in 2020. And so, sure, it was a difficult year. Cannot downplay that. Uh, but God showed up and showed out in my life and my family in some extraordinary ways, as I heard that he did in yours as well. So let's not just take this sort of worldly view that, oh, thank you that 2020 is behind us and 2021 is going to be so much better. God is good all the time, and for Christians, God is working in our lives for our good and His glory on the good days and on the bad days. So I do say Happy New Year, but I do say that God is good all the time as well. Well, we're in Hebrews, if you're reading through the Bible in a year with us, and we're going to dip into this 11th chapter, some of chapter 10. So if you want to go ahead and turn to uh, Hebrews, the very last of chapter 10, and then we'll read some of chapter 11. Amy and I were discussing what we thought the main point of the book of Hebrews was this past week. And Amy said, I think the main point is fix your eyes on Jesus. And I said, well, I can't disagree with that, but I would think that the main point is that Jesus is God's final word to us, and he's better than all the shadows and types that preceded him. And then I thought, you know, really, both of us, I think, are right, because the writer of Hebrews, God, the Holy Spirit, is saying to this church and to our church, because Jesus is better, because Jesus is the fulfillment and the final word, fix your eyes on him. So with that said, would you stand and let's honor God who has graciously given us his word. We're going to pick up in chapter 10, verse 38, and the writer is quoting out of Habakkuk. And you probably know the background of this book. We've gone through it before a couple of years ago, but this group of suffering Jewish uh, believers, they were getting it on both sides. They were getting it from their Jewish brothers and sisters who had not surrendered to Christ as King and Lord. Uh, they were being ridiculed by them. Oh, you've come to this new fangled religion, have you? And of course, they were getting beat up from the world. And so they found themselves between a rock and a hard place, and they were wanting to go back. They were tempted to go back to what they knew. They were tempted to go back to Judaism. And this book would have been very helpful to them to say there's no going back. There's nothing back there. Jesus is the final word. Jesus is the fulfillment of the shadows and types. If you go back to that, you're going back to something worse than nothing because you've been enlightened to see what's really the truth. And so in chapter 10, verse 38 and 39, he's exhorting them with a strong warning. But then in chapter 11, he gives them some positive encouragement. But my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, and the conviction of things not seen, for by it men of old gained approval." By faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous, God testifying about his gifts. And through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see so that he would not see death and he was not found because God took him up 
for he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. You may be seated. And as you're doing that, let me pray for God's blessing upon our time together in his word. Father, there, there's mystery surrounding faith. On the one hand, we will see and we have seen that faith is a gift from God. It's not something we can just muster up in and of ourselves. Yet, we see that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. We see that we are exhorted to Pray for our faith to increase. Think about the prayer in Mark 9. I believe, but help my unbelief. I think the, about the prayer in Luke 7. Increase my faith, O Lord. So there's mystery there. There's tension there. But my prayer is that today as the word is preached and meditated upon that your spirit would do something supernatural in every one of our hearts, whether they're under this roof or whether they're watching online, that for those of us who've already believed in Christ, you would increase our faith. And if there's one, if there are many who have yet to place their faith in Christ, that today that miracle would occur and they would see what is to the world unseen. They would see you as the promise-making, promise-keeping God. They would see Christ as the final word spoken and given to redeem sinful men. And through this all, we pray that your name would be lifted high. And you would be glorified. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. As I mentioned, this group of Jewish Christians, they were tempted to go back. And the writer in chapter 10 gives them some stout warnings. You know, do not go back to destruction. You go, if you leave Christ and you go back, then destruction awaits you. God in his grace would help them to burn the ships. You know the story where Cortez was motivating his folks to stay here and build a new world here, but they were wanting to go back to Spain and he went out and burned the ships and said, now, are you motivated to stay here and start a life here now? And they were. And God in AD 70 had the temple destroyed. God gave them this letter in our, in our Bibles, Hebrews, to say, burn the ships. Don't, there's no going back. Christ is the final word. Christ is better. We're not tempted, perhaps, to go back to a different form of religion, but we are tempted at times to think that there is something better than Jesus. And this book helps us on this first Sunday of the new year to remind ourselves that Jesus is the best. And we would be fools to trade him in for something that we thought would satisfy us more. But not only does this author give some woeful, stout warnings in chapter 10, but in chapter 11, there's no other chapter in our Bibles like it. In chapter 11, he gives them this hall of faith chapter where over 40 men and women are showcased as having placed their faith in God, in the promised Messiah. This author is not focused on their weaknesses, though if we individually looked at their lives and, and, and traced them out, we would see many weaknesses. And that might encourage you today that it's not about perfection, but it's about direction. 
But the author doesn't focus on their weaknesses. What he does is he focuses on the root and the fruit of their faith. One author said, one of the best ways to grow in faith is to walk with the faithful. And so he gives us over 40 men and women in chapter 11 and shows us that these have begun the walk by faith and they are continuing the walk by faith. And that would have encouraged this group of Jewish Christians tempted to throw in the towel and go back. No, no, no. Others have walked where you are walking. You, by the grace of God, can do it too. And so I would say to you this morning, Providence, I don't know what trials you're going through. I don't know what temptations you have. But Jesus is better. Spend time with faithful men and women of God. There are no perfect men and women of God, but spend time with faithful men and women of God in your church family, in your small group family, but also in the family of Hebrews 11, getting to know them and reminding yourselves of their story. One author put it this way. He said, true biblical faith is confident obedience to God's word in spite of circumstances and in spite of consequences. Let me say that again. True biblical faith is confident obedience to God's word in spite of circumstances and in spite of consequences. This faith operates quite simply. God speaks we hear his word, we trust his word, and we act on it no matter what the circumstances are, no matter what the consequences may be. The circumstances may seem impossible and the consequences frightening and unknown, but we obey God's word just the same and believe him to do what is right and what is best. Oswald Sanders put it this way, Faith enables the believing soul to treat the future as present and the invisible as seen. Do you see that component of faith? Look at chapter 11, verse 1 again. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Powerful words, assurance, conviction. These are not wimpy terms. This is not a wishful thinking. I hope the Falcons will win today. Actually, I hope they lose because if they lose, they get a higher draft pick in April, right? So I really am hoping that they lose. But this isn't that kind of hope. This isn't I hope it doesn't rain today because we're having a picnic. This is assurance of things hoped for. This is future. You're looking into the future and you're saying, I hope that this happens, but I have assurance of what I hope for. And I have a conviction of things that I can't see. I, I know that they're real. Someone said a conviction is anything you would be willing to take a bullet for. So this writer is saying faith, and he's really not giving a definition of what faith is. He's, he's showing what faith does, what it looks like in action. And then he gives about 40 examples. But I want you to look back at chapter 10, verse 34 for a moment and, and just see this played out. You remember chapter 10, if you've been reading, and uh, you had this group and they were being put in prison because of their faith in Christ. Uh, they were having their, their possessions uh, taken or, or destroyed. And then who's going to take care of them, right? So, so maybe you weren't the one in prison. Maybe you weren't the one who had your house burned down. But your brother in Christ did. So are you going to just sit back and let them suffer? Or are you going to take action and they knew if they took action, they would suffer too, right? I mean, if Hunter's in prison, if Byron's in prison, and I'm not, but I go and give them food and drink, then all of a sudden they know I'm one of them. So I get put in prison or I have my house burned down. And so would they do it or not? And verse 34 says, oh, yes, they did it. And they did it joyfully, even though they knew they were going to suffer 
For you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. You know, as they were on their way to the prison with food and water and clothing, and they looked over their shoulder and they saw their house up in smoke, they counted it a privilege. They had joy because they knew that's not my home. I have a better home. I have a lasting home in heaven on the new earth. And and yet it wasn't there yet. So they're looking by faith. And that's where 11.1 comes in. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Look at verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God, number one, must believe that he is. And number two, must believe that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. So just let me pull a little bit of meat off the bone here as we move through this quickly. Verse two, for by it, by what? By faith. The men of old gained approval. And then he's going to give two men of old. He's going to give Abel and he's going to give Enoch. And then he just starts rolling in verse 7 with Noah. And he doesn't quit until verse 39. And, And if you add them up, there's about 40 men and women who have started the race and are running the race by faith. So by it, men of old gained approval. The people in the Old Testament, the saints of God in the Old Testament, were saved by faith. That's what it means, gained approval. They were accepted by God. They were saved by grace alone, through faith alone, trusting in God alone, and trusting in God's Word alone. And God's Word showed that the appointed means of forgiveness of sin would be a sacrifice offered. A life for a life. And so we see that in Genesis 3.21. We see Adam and Eve sinned, right? And they covered themselves with fig leaves, but that didn't cut it. And so God went out and killed an animal and covered them with the animal skin. Genesis 3.21, the first example of without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Without a life for a life substitute, you cannot be atoned for. And so... They were saved by grace alone, through faith alone, trusting in God and God's appointed word and means, which is a substitute, a sacrifice. And that's why, that's at least one of the reasons why Abel was accepted and Cain was not. Look at verse 3. By faith we understand that the worlds, some translations say the ages, Literally, it means all of time and space. We understand by faith that the worlds were prepared, how? By the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. Everything was made out of nothing but the word of God. God spoke everything that is, including time. He spoke it into being. Verse 6 again, Without faith is impossible to please God, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder. When we come to God, obviously we're not going to come to someone who we don't believe exists. But we believe that He is, and that, that's profound. It means that we're believing that God is absolute. He is the essence of being. He's the first and best of all beings. If you've ever, as a child, asked your mom or dad, who created God? The answer is, no one created God. God is the uncreated creator. He's the uncaused cause. He's the divine designer of the divine design. So we believe that God is, but more, 
We must believe that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Isn't that interesting that that would be part of the very DNA of true saving faith? You know, some, some people, I've, I've heard it said, well, I don't, I don't deserve a reward. I don't want a reward. If I, get, if I get to heaven, if I have the smallest mansion or the smallest, I guess smallest mansion, that's an oxymoron. The smallest shack, I'll be happy. I, I don't need nothing, don't want nothing, don't deserve nothing. Well, true, true, true. But that's not the character of the God of the Bible. He is a rewarder which means he is rich, he is good, he is kind. This is part of his very nature. And faith, if it's true faith, must believe in the God revealed in Scripture. We don't get to make up who we think God would be. We have to submit and trust in the God who is. And aren't you glad this morning that the God who is is a kind and rich and merciful God who says, I reward those who seek me. Listen, even if the reward isn't always and isn't fully in this life right now. I'm not saying it's not in part. But it's not fully in this life. Hence, faith. The assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of things not seen. Listen, sin, self, Satan, and the system of this world will tempt you to doubt one, if not both, of those components. There will be times when you doubt that God even exists. But then there will be times when you say, okay, I believe you exist, but I don't believe you're good. I don't believe you're kind or rich or merciful. I don't believe you're a rewarder of those who seek you. I've sought you and I've come out on the short end of the stick. There's going to be temptations on both sides. And we have to go back to Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. We have to walk with faithful men and women in our lives and in the Scripture we have to pray for perseverance, continue to read God's word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And this will help us to persevere in faith. Now, let's come up for air for just a moment. Because up till now, we've looked squarely at Hebrews 10 and 11. And that's good. We want to get our information from, from Scripture, from a small portion of Scripture rather than just jumping and darting all over the Bible. But what I want to do for, for now is I want to actually give you a definition of faith. I said to you that this is not really a definition of faith. It's a description of faith. It shows us what faith looks like in action. We saw that in Hebrews 10, 34, the group who had their house burned down because they served their brothers and sisters who were in prison. We've, we've briefly glanced at it in Abel's life, in Enoch's life. If we have time, we're going to scroll down to verse 23 and look at Moses and Moses' parents. But before we get to all of that, let me give you a definition of faith. The word, Greek word, pistis. It occurs 240 times in the New Testament, 39 times in Hebrews, 26 times in this chapter. By faith, by faith, by faith is mentioned 19 times. It's a very important word. What does this word pistis mean? Literally, it means an inner attitude of trust and dependence upon the promises of God and the God of promise. Let me say that again. An inner attitude of trust and dependence upon the promises of God and the God of promise. You might have heard this story, but I think this illustrates it quite well. There was a missionary to Africa, and he was in a, a part of Africa that had no scripture, had no Christians. And he was there front line, and he's trying to 
uh, through storytelling, lead these folks to Christ, as well as copy the scripture, translate the scripture into their language. He understood that they had no word for faith in their language. No word for faith. So he's racking his brain because faith is a pretty big word. It comes up 240 times in the New Testament. And he's praying for help. God, give me help. I don't, they don't even have a word in their language for faith. How am I to translate the scriptures into their language if, if, if there's no word for faith? And he sees this man come in from a hard day's work. He comes into the very hut where this man is. And he just throws himself onto a hammock and lets out a, a word that he had never heard. And he asked the others, he said, what, what word did he just say? And they told the word, and he said, what does that mean? And the word meant, meant this, I am resting all of my weight upon this hammock. And he said, that's it. That's the word for faith. So he used that very word, and when he was translating the book of Hebrews, for example, he would use that word when it came to faith. I'm resting all of my weight upon God, the God of promise and the promises of God. I'm resting all of my weight upon Jesus Christ. Isn't that interesting? So, have you cast yourself, not leaving one foot on the ground just in case the hammock breaks. But have you cast yourself entirely upon the mercy of God in Jesus Christ? Have you said, Lord, I'm all in. I'm not reserving anything for the just in case, but I'm all in. Resting my soul for all of eternity in Jesus Christ. Wayne Grudem asks an interesting question in his systematic theology. He says, but why is faith the means by which we are connected to all that God is for us in Christ? Why not joy? Why not servitude? Why faith? Listen to his answer. He says, it is apparently because faith is the one attitude of heart that is the exact opposite of depending on ourselves. When we come to Christ in faith, we essentially say, I give up. I will not depend on myself or my own good works any longer. I know that I can never make myself righteous before God. Therefore, Jesus, I trust and depend entirely upon you to make me righteous before God. In this way, Grudem says, faith is the exact opposite of trusting in ourselves. And therefore, it is the attitude that perfectly fits salvation that depends not at all on our merit, but entirely on God's free gift of grace so that God receives all of the credit and glory. Now, we can, we can quickly overstate the case when we have a sermon or a study on faith. Some people have faith in faith. You with me? It's as though faith is the end all. Faith is the savior, right? We just need to have more faith. And faith in who? Faith in what? Well, I don't know. We just need to have more of it. And let's don't go there. Faith is a means to an end. God himself, God in Christ is the end. Faith doesn't save you. God, through Christ, saves us as we place our faith in Christ. So let's don't overstate it. I said to you that the writer of Hebrews does not spend time pointing out the weaknesses of these 40 men and women. But if you took time and went back through the scriptures, you would see many weaknesses in these 40 men and women. They were not perfect. So I want to encourage you this morning. It's not the size of your faith, but the object of your faith that's the main thing. You might say, I don't have a great faith. 
Well, join the club. But do you have faith in the great God? Do you have faith in the great God of the Bible, the one true living triune God of Scripture? But just as we don't want to overstate it, we don't want to understate it either. Without faith, Hebrews eleven six says, it is impossible to please God. We are to live by faith. We are to die by faith. We are to pray by faith. We are to persevere by faith. And as you're going to see in just a moment, a lack of faith is not a weakness, but a wickedness. Given how absolutely trustworthy God is, how much he has revealed to us, even in general revelation, God has gone way out of his way to show us that he is real and that he is good. You with me so far? Everybody awake? Okay. A.W. Pink says that faith is like two people standing on the beach looking out over the sea and one says there's a ship coming to rescue us and the other says I see nothing. But the first man has a telescope in his hand. The ship is really there. Just because the second man can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. Doesn't mean it's not on the way. The ship is really there whether he sees it or not. God puts this telescope, as it were, in our hand and we see him who is really there. You might say it like this. God grants it to us to believe and we do believe. God doesn't believe for us. We really believe through this gift of faith. John 3.3, 3, Nicodemus, that story, and Jesus said, unless a man is born again, you can't even see the kingdom of God, let alone enter it. But you can't even see it unless God does something in our lives called born again, called granting us faith. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 tells us that faith is a gift of God. But as I mentioned earlier, there's mystery here. I don't want you to, to have this fatalistic mindset. Whether you're here right now and you're not a Christian at all, or whether you're here and you're saying, I'm a Christian, but man, I'm just stuck on first base. I can't seem to get to second base, third base. I'm just stuck. But Pastor Brent says that faith is a gift from God. He quoted John 3.3. 3. He quoted Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. So I guess I'll just have to sit back and passively see if God gives me that gift this year in 2021. And that's not what I'm saying at all. It is a gift. But the mystery is in Mark 9.24, I believe Help my unbelief. In Luke 7, give me faith. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. We see that one of the means of grace is by walking with faithful men and women. God gives us or increases our faith. So do not sit back passively. Do not sit back and say, God, if you want me to have faith, I guess you'll give me faith. Pray for faith. Read God's word on your knees, asking God to show you the treasures of Scripture. Walk with faithful men and women. Let them rub off on you, as it were. Romans 1 tells us that our unbelief is not God's fault. It's our fault. We high-handedly suppress the knowledge of the truth because we really don't want to believe that there's a God that we will give an account to. Tozer said, if every human on earth suddenly went blind, it would not for one second extinguish the beauty and brilliance of the sun, the moon, the stars, the oceans, the rivers, and the mountains. These aspects of who God is are there whether we can see them or not. God, the creator, the sustainer, he is there whether we can see him or not. We are the blind ones. 
And our blindness, Romans 1 says, is a self-inflicted, self-imposed blindness. We can't see God because we don't want to. It's like the jewel thief who says, I cannot find a police officer. As I said earlier, unbelief is not a weakness, it's a wickedness. We are saying to the first and best of all beings, we're saying to the one who is the truth, the one who is altogether lovely, you're not trustworthy, you're not loving, you're not real. We must repent of this wickedness. Listen, faith is not a leap into the darkness. Faith is a leap out of the darkness. One more ingredient on defining faith, and then we'll move to, uh, to the end of our, of our message here. Spurgeon said it this way, there is a threefold component to faith, knowledge, belief, and trust. Martin Lloyd-Jones put it this way, there's awareness, there's assent, there's commitment. I don't want to overwhelm you with too much information, but... Part of it is our mind. We, we have to understand things about God and about the truth, about who He is and who we are. But it's more than our minds. There's a heart component. Faith believes in the head but embraces in the heart. You can know your Bible backwards and forwards, but if the truth that you're coming to know settles in and stagnates in the bottom of your brain and doesn't travel 18 inches into your heart, then that is not true faith. You're like James 2.19. Even the demons believe and tremble. So true saving faith has certain mental assent certain knowledge about the truths of God's Word, but it's more than just knowledge. There's an embracing. You might say it like this, true saving faith believes the truth, but it also rejoices over the truth, delights in the truth, loves the truth. And then there's a will or a commitment component to it. And that's what Hebrews 11 is all about. It's really not showing us justification by faith. It's showing us sanctification by faith. These men and women in chapter 11, these 40 men and women, it's not really showing us how they got saved. It's showing us how they lived as a saved man or woman of God. They did so by faith, and their faith had action. Their faith took steps. Their faith had fruit. Martin Luther said that we are saved by faith alone, but never by a faith that remains alone. Obedience is the fruit of true faith. No fruit, no root. So, the author of this book was encouraging, assisting his flock on how to fulfill Hebrews 10, 38 and 39. In other words, how to not shrink back to destruction, but how to persevere to the end. And part of his strategy is to show the flock that there were men and women of old who started the race and finished the race by faith. And this was a great encouragement to them, and it should be a great encouragement to us. Now, just briefly, look down to chapter 11, verse 23. And I'm not going to read all of this. Um, just want to talk a little bit about Moses' parents. They don't get much press time. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. And then 24 through 29 shows us the faith of Moses. But you know, when I read this, I saw this mind, heart, and will component of faith. Moses' parents, this is what their faith was looked like in action. It did not fear man ultimately. It feared God ultimately. Now think about that. There was a twofold edict given by the king that says, number one, you bring me all of your newborn sons or else. So you either bring them to me or you die. 
And Moses' parents said, "Mm -mm, we don't fear the king. We fear God. Because we fear God, we're going to disobey the king. So faith doesn't fear man, at least not ultimately, but faith fears God ultimately. And that fear of God moves us to take action. I love Proverbs 14, 26. It says, in the fear of the Lord, there's strong confidence. I can't tell you how many times I've quoted that verse to myself. As I'm about to speak up and say something to an unbeliever or to a believer, however it might be, but I know this is going to be controversial. I know that I might go from hero to zero quickly in this person's mind if I open my mouth. And the fear of man creeps up, and I just want to shut up and take the easy way out, right? But then I think, you know what? I fear God more than I fear man. And in the fear of the Lord, there is strong confidence. So I'll sort of reason this way. God, I'm, I fear disappointing, displeasing you more than I fear what they're going to say about me. And that emboldens me to take action. And that's exactly what happened with Moses' mom and dad. They had a plan. They developed a plan. We're going to uh, hide him before his birth, right? So there was some way that they made it not so obvious that his mother was pregnant. And then when she had the baby, they hid the baby for three months. And then they pitched a basket. They sent his sister. They sent him down the river. It was a pretty extravagant plan. But so we derive at least two things from this story, that faith fears God more than man, and faith has a plan. Maybe you need to hear that this morning at the beginning of 2021. Maybe you've got some some goals, but they're just sort of pie-in-the-sky goals. You know, God, I want to be a more godly man this year. God, I want to be a more godly woman. God, I want my children to be saved this year. God, I want to serve you more faithfully at church in, in Rome, Georgia. And, and if you want me to go on that mission trip, Lord, make it happen. And, but But faith makes a plan. Listen, it's not plan or have faith. It's plan by faith. Let me say that again. It's not plan or faith. It's plan by faith. Faith trusts God, but does not tempt God. God, you're going to take care of us this year. I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to work. I'm not going to, you know, put, put forth any effort, but you're just going to take care of us. Now, that's tempting the Lord thy God. Faith believes God, but does not belittle God-appointed means. We trust in the sovereignty of God. We pray hard. We plan well. James 4 reminds us to write our plans in pencil and to carry a big eraser. Right? But we do. Make plans. So I encourage you as an individual Christian, you got these goals of I want to I be a better prayer warrior. I want to I want to memorize the scripture better. I want to be a better soul winner. I want to be more faithful in my community where I work, play, and live. I want to go on a mission trip this year. I want my kids to get saved. I want to be a better husband, a better mother, a better father, a better wife. Great. Great. What's your plan? By faith, by prayer, With wisdom, what's your plan? Write it in pencil, but write it. And get a godly brother or sister to come alongside you and help hold you accountable. The way Amram and Jochebed did for Moses. I can see it now. They were like Esther. If I perish, I perish. They were like Peter and the apostles. We must obey God rather than man. But they feared God more than they feared man. And they made a plan. You know, I told you that there's over 40 examples in this short chapter. We've looked at a couple of them. But I want to close us out 
by showing you the greatest example given. And I'm, I'm talking about Jesus. Jesus is the best. Listen, not only did Jesus walk by faith, not only did Jesus fear God more than man, not only did he have a plan and stick to that plan, but Jesus is the author and perfecter of faith. Look at chapter 12, verses 1 through 3 briefly with me. Therefore, in light of all 40 of these examples, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Proverbs 22.1 says that a good name is to be more desired than silver and gold. And Joe taught us well this morning in Sunday school that Jesus has the greatest name ever given. But do you know that while he walked this earth, Jesus had his name dragged through the mud so often and to such depths that it should shock us and make us weep. And I'm sure there was a temptation for him. Proverbs 22.1, a great name, a good name is more desired than silver or gold. He's got the name above all names. His name is being dragged through the mud. I'm sure there was a moment of temptation where he thought, but, but I'm not an illegitimate person, an illegitimate son, as he was called. I'm not a drunkard or a glutton. I'm not insane or filled with demons. I am loved by my father. I am my father's beloved one. But Jesus didn't steer off course to keep a good reputation with man. He stayed the course and said, you know, I don't care what you think about me. I am looking to that day when I hear my father say, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. Isn't that what chapter 12, verse 2 and 3 say? For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. He kept his eye on what mattered most. He feared God more than man. He, he wanted God's approval more than man's approval. John 4, 34 says, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work for me. John 8, 29 says, I always do that which pleases my Father. So that's how Jesus walked by faith. He kept his eye on the Father. He envisioned the joy he would experience with his father, when his father said, well done, good and faithful servant. You finished the course. You did it perfectly. And that enabled him to not give in, to cut corners, so that man would say, oh, you, we, we really do like you. He could endure the ill treatment of man because he kept his eye on pleasing his father. And that's what faith does. So, I close with this. 2021, I don't know what kind of year it's going to be. You don't know what kind of year it's going to be. We know God's on his throne. We know he's good all the time. He's always working for his people's good and his glory. But I want to give you this advice. Keep your eyes on Jesus. He is better than fill in the blank. In fact, he's the best, period. Period. When God is big, man is little. When man is big, God is little. When Christ is big, faith is big. When Christ is small, faith is small. So keep your eyes on Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible, and your faith will grow. It will. 
If you're here this morning and you're not a believer, you have never thrust yourself upon Christ, cast yourself into his arms. Here's my encouragement to you. This year, open your Bible, read your Bible with prayer. God, would you open my eyes to behold wonderful things from your word? Believe the scriptures of God and the God of scriptures. Place your faith, no matter how small it may be, in the enormous Christ of scripture. And you will find that he is mighty to save and he is mighty to keep you. As we partake of the Lord's Supper now, this is to bring spiritual nourishment to our faith as well. As we remember vividly, tangibly, what God in Christ has done to pardon us, to purchase us, to redeem us, to ransom us. So we encourage you, baptized believer, with clear conscience with God and man, we encourage you to avail yourself of this means of grace. Grow in your faith along with your church family as we remember Jesus. Let's pray. Father, would you take your word, plant it deep into every one of our hearts. Would you breathe upon it and water it with your sovereign spirit? For those who are already in the faith, would you grow us because of your faithfulness? And if any are not yet, then we pray that even right now, they are casting themselves completely, without reservation, upon the tender mercies of God in Christ. We pray that by your grace and for your glory, all of 2021 would be spent with us fixing our eyes upon Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.